In this episode, Fatal Attraction, we're talking about the negative outcomes of poor safety at work, how we think about those outcomes, how we talk about them, and how we measure them. This episode was inspired by something that someone posted in my own workplace. It was a printout stuck just above a photocopier of an article from satirical website, The Onion. The headline read, Study, 90% of workplace injuries caused by bare-knuckle boxing. It went on to describe a study from the University of Illinois, which stated that, According to our data, roughly 9 of every 10 injuries that occur on the job stem from incidents in which two employees stand up from their desks, roll up their sleeves, clench their raised hands in fists, and then circle each other before unleashing a barrage of gloveless blows. Now, it's satire, that's fine, it's kind of funny, but it made me think about how polarised our thinking about workplace safety incidents really is. We either make fun of paper cuts, before knuckle fighting, people would often joke about office workers' safety with reference to paper cuts, or focus heavily on major catastrophic outcomes for individuals, their death at work. Everything that happens in between kind of gets forgotten. In part one of this episode, Not Coming Home, we talk about fatalities at work and how we cover them in the media. In part two, we move on to talk about how many people get injured, what those injuries look like, and later we'll talk to an expert on injury reporting about how we can improve the measurements we use to index safety performance. Part one, Not Coming Home. The family of an 18-year-old killed on a Sydney construction site on Monday is calling on the government to take immediate action to improve safety for workers. Christopher Cassaniti was crushed to death by scaffolding in the accident in Sydney's northwest, in which a 40-year-old man was also injured. The death of Christopher Cassaniti on a Sydney construction site earlier this year was a terrible tragedy. He was killed in a scaffolding collapse just a week after his 18th birthday. It drew commentary from political leaders and was featured in the news for several days after the event. As yet, there's still no report on the factors that contributed to the incident. Sadly, Christopher was one of 51 Australians already in the first four months of the year to not come home from work. The number of workplace fatalities per year have been falling since 2007. The exact figures can move a little bit, and there's often a time lag in the data as fatalities are confirmed. The most recent confirmed figures, which were for 2016, indicate that 182 Australians were killed at work that year. Half of those were in the transport, warehousing and postal industry, followed by agriculture and construction. And that's an industrial pattern of fatalities that's been consistent for a decade. Most fatalities are caused by a vehicle collision, about 38%, followed by falls from height, being hit by moving objects, or being hit by falling objects. These are sobering statistics, and statistics that we don't really hear much about. We might hear about individual cases as news, but we don't seem to have a sense of how many people are killed each year at work, or how that happens. I started to wonder about the reporting of fatalities, and how that might drive that bipolar effect that we discussed earlier, that we focus either on extreme events or joke about illegitimate ones. It led me to some Canadian research on how workplace fatalities are covered in newspapers. The title of the article by Barnardson and Foster, 2015, kind of sums it up. It's titled, If It Bleeds, It Leads. They examined newspaper reporting of workplace incidents between 2009 and 2014 and compared that to the actual statistics. Essentially, what they found was that the media reports vastly overrepresented fatalities relative to their occurrence. So that means that a much higher proportion of the articles on workplace incidents were about fatalities, 
compared to the relatively small proportion of fatalities among all workplace incidents. In the same way, the news articles also overreported injuries to men relative to women and injuries in particular sectors, such as construction and mining. Burns and fires and traumatic injuries were focused on too, and I guess those things are unsurprising. The sensational, the unusual, or vivid get reported on. We might also expect that, as has been found in other research, that incidents with multiple fatalities are rated as more serious by the public, as are incidents involving higher degrees of empathy or familiarity, like those involving children or young people, or those who are in some way seen as blameless in relation to what happens to them. Perhaps familiarity also explains how workplace fatalities still don't change attitudes to safety more broadly. Because there are so many different industries, and we don't all have experience in them, we just can't relate. You might contrast that to how the public thinks about and responds to the road toll. It's arguably different, as we've all been there as road users in some form or another. Interestingly, the Canadian newspaper research found that the perspective of workers was unreported, with views from authorities such as the police or safety regulators being more common. Responses to the fatalities from families and co-workers were scarce. In the Casaniti case, we've not seen evidence of that. His family have spoken to the media, and video footage of the chaos of the scene including workers' frustration at not being able to help remove the pile of scaffolding, is widely available. It's visceral and very difficult to watch. The Cassinides have pleaded for improvements to safety in construction, and it'll be interesting to see how this sad case, and others like it, play into a wider discussion on industrial manslaughter legislation in Australia. The recent Boland review of the model workplace health and safety laws has recommended this controversial development. But the main point of this research was to highlight how the way in which workplace fatalities are reported may have an effect on how we view safety more generally. Focusing on extreme outcomes can overshadow more common but still quite negative outcomes such as injuries and disease. As Barnardson and Foster put it, Overreporting catastrophic but relatively rare events and portraying those events as restricted to a small number of occupations contributes to the construction of workplace injuries and fatalities as tragic but uncommon events, a social construction that belies the hundreds of thousands of workplace injuries that occur each year in Canada. In other words, focusing on fatalities in a small number of industries can drive the commonly held view that if you're not going to die in your job, then all the actions we take for safety are a bit pointless. Paradoxically, reporting only on fatalities makes safety a joke. So, for the record, What are the injury and disease stats? The first thing we should probably say is that in reality, the fatality data that we've been talking about doesn't include those who die as a consequence of a disease they contracted at work. The most common example of this is mesothelioma, after exposure to asbestos. The best estimates we have put the figure at over 2,000 Australians per year dying of work-related diseases. Diseases can be tricky in that, like mesothelioma, they have a long latency period. But this shows that the fatality figures, which we don't communicate about, underestimate the number of people who die from work-related causes each year. Based on the most recently available data, 2016-17, to 
The biggest category of workplace injury in Australia is musculoskeletal disorders. The top mechanisms of injury are what's called body stressing, followed by falls, slips and trips, and being hit by moving objects. Notably, among the classification of diseases, which is defined as a condition resulting from repeated or long-term exposure, mental disorders are the most common nature of disease. They account for about 7% of all serious workplace compensation claims. We could talk about these stats all day, breaking them down by gender, occupation, industry, part of the body, and look at the trends over time. Most people find it pretty boring, though. The point is that there's more to safety than just fatalities. Fatalities affect large numbers of people, families, friends, communities, and so do the workplace injuries and diseases that you'd probably never hear about unless you've experienced them or know someone who has. So now we could just say that we need to communicate better about injuries and diseases. And yes, we probably do. But there's another problem. Injury and disease data are based on workers' compensation figures. And they are fundamentally flawed. I spoke with Associate Professor Sharon O'Neill, an expert in injury reporting and safety measurement from UNSW ADFA in Canberra. I started out by asking her about the problems of relying on compensation data. Well, there's a couple of problems. The biggest one being compensation data doesn't measure safety. Injury data doesn't measure safety. Um, It's not even a very strong indicator of safety. So if we think about what measurement means, we can measure something that has a physical property of a material system. So you can measure the height of something, you can measure the weight of something, but you can't measure a social construct because uh, there's no property to measure. So what we're looking at um, in terms of injury measures, injuries are a good measure of harm to people and damage to people, but they don't measure safety. So if I wanted to measure safety, I have to think about what safety is. It's freedom from the risk of injury or illness, So we're really looking at issues around exposure to harm and the risk of harm, and that's what we need to be targeting measures toward if we want to start to get a sense of safety and we want to understand safety in an organisation. Injury measures don't cut it. And that's for a couple of reasons, not only because they're not a valid measure of safety, but when we look at injury measures, they have a whole lot of limitations in themselves. Okay, so that's really interesting. Injury data is about outcomes yes and levels of harm and types of harm and how many people get harmed yes it's about the damage to people at work so let's talk about the problems in those measures Mm -hmm. and then let's talk about what we should be doing to measure safety so the problems with injury measures so compensation and injury measures what what are those okay so again there's two real categories of problems. The first is that injury measures are not terribly reliable. We measure injuries in different ways and there's a lot of under-reporting. And if we look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics data, it shows that increasingly work-related injuries are not necessarily being compensated through compensation systems. We've got an increasing number where companies are paying some of the costs related to the injury. And that's not only for the minor injuries, because you could kind of expect that if it's a very minor injury. But in some cases, we've got some quite significant costs being paid for by companies outside compensation schemes. Some of them are self-insurers, and so Mm. they're taking on that risk and financial cost themselves. But others are really just not wanting to put injuries through the compensation system. Um, And then we have some that are compensated through income protection schemes. Some people um, have had absences due to injury compensated through um, public social security systems. Um, And so there's a whole different range of ways people get compensated, not necessarily through the workers' compensation schemes. So if we're looking at workers' comp data, it's inherently limited because it doesn't capture everything. So it's an underestimate. Underestimate, yeah. Significant. Well, I say significant. Um, There's a whole lot of occupations and people that don't get included in our compensation data. So, for example, um, sole traders aren't included, 
there's a lot of uh, emergency services will have their own schemes. So there's different groups that aren't included by design, but then there's also the underreporting issue. So in the end, it is quite underreported. Then, of course, the other issue is how do we actually measure injuries? So if you think about an injury, if I say I have an injury, it could be anything from a paper cut to a broken neck. They're all one injury. So if we want to try and measure injuries, we have to have a way of being able to classify them in categories that make sense to measure and that can actually add value to our information, our decision-making process. Um, at the moment, the most frequent and prevalent injury measure across the world is a lost time injury rate. And that's highly problematic. Okay. So <laughs> lots of problems here. Lots of problems. So... Lost time injury frequency rate, yes. sometimes known as LTIFR. Yeah. Tell us about that and, and what its problems are. Okay. So it does all sound quite negative at the moment, but it will get better. <laughs> um, the problems with lost time injury rates, they're a good measure of productivity lost, as the name suggests. They're not a good measure of injury. So they're measuring lost time, meaning time that people are off work? Uh, the lost time injury doesn't lost work day does so basically a lost time injury is counting every time someone has an injury that causes them to lose at least one shift or day of work so i could have three lost time injuries one might be somebody off for a day one might be someone off for a month one might be someone off for a year they're all lost time injuries one each so that's the number of injuries. It's, it's giving you a measure of the frequency of incidents that cause lost time. So in that way, it's, it's a measure of productivity. Um, I would need to pair that with a severity measure, like mm. total lost work days, to get a sense of how much time was lost. Yes, because frequency is not telling you anything about severity. Correct. As you've said, with one shift, one day, yes. one week, one year. Yes. So... Um, in terms of lost time injury rates, as I said, it's a good measure of productivity, but it's not a safety measure. I could have an incident on a Tuesday where I sprain my ankle, I'm off work for a day or two days recovering. That's a lost time injury. If I have exactly the same injury on a Friday, I get the weekend to recover, so it's not a lost time injury. Oh. And it's exactly the same injury. Wow. So it's actually not a measure of injury. It's a measure of the impact of injury on an organisation. So that, as a measure, sounds really compromised. Yes. And interestingly, it's the most common statistic that organisations use in their annual reports and on their websites to talk about safety. It has been. This is changing. This is changing, uh, which is great. Um, and the new global reporting initiative is part of that change. And I'll probably come back to that sure. in a minute. Mm -hmm. But I think if we think about the way we've traditionally measured injury and illness, it's very much from the point of view of the impact of that incident on the company. So we talk about things like first aid, the company provided first aid, medical treatment, person had some medical treatment but no lost time. Restricted duties, they can't do the full complement of work. Lost time injuries, they're actually away from work. And then fatality. And they've been the traditional categories. And so each of those are actually looking at the injury from the perspective of the company but not looking at the injury from the perspective of damage to the person. Mm. And so some of the conversations that we've had, or certainly that I've had in research conversations with executives, I present them that table, the traditional table, and say, what do you think about these injury categories? And they tell me invariably that, you know, first aid injuries are very minor and medical treatment are a little bit more serious and then first aid, in, uh, sorry, lost time injuries are the most serious. And I say, okay, so does that mean a medical treatment, how would you classify permanent hearing loss? And they'd say, well, that would be medical treatment. They're not having time off, but they've lost their hearing. So are you telling me that permanent hearing loss is less serious than someone who sprained an ankle and back at work fully recovered in two days? And then they stop and think. And 
realise that actually, no, it's not about severity at all. It's really about the impact on the company, on the organisation, but not about the impact on the person. Mm. So here's where we have to really change the way we think about injury if we're really trying to get at injury measures as damage to people and trying to understand you know, the impact on workers from workplace health and safety. So following those conversations, do people start getting rid of the LTIFRs or stop using them? We actually have had some success with that. Yeah, there are a number of companies that have now moved to an alternative measure. And the alternatives is really about saying, um, if we look at it the other way and say, let's look at the impact on people, then we look back to the work of Jeff McDonald, who was an Australian forensic safety engineer, who said we really need to be classifying injuries and illnesses according to their impact on people. And he advocated a system where he said class one are anything that has lifelong impact on the person. So anything resulting in a lifelong damage. Class two is an injury that the person sustains where there might be some impairment, but they will recover. And class three is just an inconvenience, like your paper cut doesn't really matter, doesn't in incapacitate you in any way. There's no impairment. Tell us about the Global Reporting Initiative. The Global Reporting Initiative is a group that's based out of Amsterdam. Um, they prepare standards for reporting. They're voluntary standards, international standards. They came about after the 80s. When In the 1980s, we saw a number of, you know, as you probably well aware, um, a number of big disasters, like we had Bhopal and we had the Exxon Valdez and we had, you know, uh, Chernobyl not long after that. So we had a number of big worldwide disasters and people started asking serious questions about the impact that companies are having on the environment, on health and safety, and, you know, the sort of social and environmental impacts that get left out of the traditional financial reports. So the Global Reporting Initiative was developed to produce some standards to address the burgeoning amount of corporate social responsibility reporting because it became obvious fairly quickly that a lot of companies reporting on CSR, corporate social responsibility, were starting to turn it into a bit of a PR exercise. Mm. And the information that was coming out wasn't necessarily reliable, wasn't relevant in some cases, it was very biased. And also we found that companies were reporting different things. So for example, um, part of my PhD was looking at um, occupational health and safety measures in annual reports of mining and energy companies. And in one sample of 15 companies, they'd measured lost time injury rates in 13 different ways. Wow. So we had all of these different sort of definitions of how we measure things. And then there was things where they would say, for example, we've had no fatalities this year compared to two last year. And you'd say, hang on, I looked at your last year's report. There wasn't two last year. So companies were being selective about when they reported and what they reported. Or they would report a lost time injury rate for a couple of years because it's coming down and it's looking good and they're reporting it saying how wonderful it is. And then the next year they would say, oh, our rate's not so good this year. We're going to report a different measure. So we'll report medical treatment injury or all injury instead of lost time. So the Global Reporting Initiative tried to standardise a little bit more the metrics that were reported and the processes for reporting so that users of the reports had better quality information. They could make decisions, compare across different companies much more easily and get some more robust information. So one of the standards they developed was an occupational health and safety reporting standard. And it's had four different iterations over time since 1998. Um, the latest version has had some significant changes and uh, I was pleased enough to be involved in that process. Many of the changes have actually followed some of the work that we're doing here in Australia, which is considered to be at the forefront of work around measuring and also around the way we deal with the scope of workers. So instead of looking at employer or employee, which the previous versions had done, they've now adopted the same kind of approach that the Australian legisla legislation has around um, worker and person conducting a business or undertaking. PCBU. PCBU. Yeah, so this, the scope of workers, I think there's, there's four sort of key 
differences and one is around the scope of workers one is around um, really emphasizing a lot more the hierarchy of control and the management approach so encouraging companies to talk about how they're managing and to bring out leading indicators so moving away from a reliance primarily on your injury measures Mm which is actually really good because of what it's saying is that we're interested in understanding health and safety, not just understanding damage. But both are important. Um, And then, of course, the actual injury and health measures come out quite strongly as well. Earlier we looked at some of the compensation data around, for example, musculoskeletal disorders and other injuries. While injury data can be limited, Sharon went on to make the point that it's still really important to look at injury data because it does help us get an understanding of some things, particularly harm. It might not be useful for indexing safety, but it does still give us indications of what kind of harm is happening to people at work. When you talk about the problems with injury measures, I think one of the things that we need to get in there somewhere is... um, Yes, there's problems with injury measures, but it's still really important to measure them. Sure. And it's important to look at severity and frequency. So if you have a measure like TRIFA, total recordable injury frequency, or total recordable injuries, that's basically giving you class one plus class two. So that's a measure of the frequency of damage. So total recordable injuries is a really important measure. And then your high consequence measures, which is your class one, is also really important. So the class ones will have fatalities, obviously, but not only fatalities, also anything that causes lifelong damage. And that could be losing a limb, losing eyesight. Um, It could be disfigurement from a burn. It could be uh, scarring. It could be brain damage, psychological injury. So when we look at um, the injury rates, We need to be capturing fatalities. We also need to be capturing lifelong damage. And there is always questions asked about how do I know if an injury is going to be temporary or is going to be permanent? And the research has shown that if a person has not recovered fully by six months from the date of injury, then they're likely to have some effects from that for the rest of their life. So that's really our cutoff point when we're talking about high consequence injury and illness. If the person hasn't recovered fully at the six month mark, we would classify it as a class one. We were talking about lots of problems in injury, compensation data, and how we report these statistics. We then moved on to talk about what we should be doing to index safety in a more effective way. So we're really interested in measuring safety though, right? So what are we supposed to do to measure safety more effectively? Okay, so if we're measuring safety, we need to obviously stop looking at injury rates as safety measures. We really need to be able to understand what we're doing to manage safety and then look for indicators of those controls. So particularly um, important are our lead and lag indicators of critical controls. So if we've identified the kinds of hazards we have, the, we've done the risk assessment, so we understand the risk that's associated with our hazards, we've put in place controls, we need to be evaluating the effectiveness of the controls to give us a sense of how safe our organisation is. So what we often see, and particularly in annual reports, we see lots of measures around things like training and audits. And so we would see lots of lead indicators of that, such as the number of training sessions we've offered or the number of audits we've conducted. But we very rarely see the lag indicators that tell us how many people are trained and competent or how many audit non-conformances did we find. Or if it's a performance audit where we're actually looking for opportunities for improvement, how many opportunities for improvement have we found and how many have we actually actioned? So... um, I think the thing around trying to get a sense of safety is really looking for the signals that can help us make better health and safety decisions. If we're looking for a magic bullet one number that says this is your safety, I think that's very problematic because once we start aggregating a whole lot of data into one number, you're going to necessarily lose the nuance of different pockets of your organisation where safety may be really well 
managed and where it may not be so well managed. So we need to be thinking about what are the hazards that we have and how can we evaluate the effectiveness of the controls we have in place. Lead indicators tend to be positive, while lag indicators tend to be negative. Is that right? That's, a, yeah, that's a common misconception, I think, um, that exists within safety space. In that, it's absolutely correct if we're talking about a reference point of that point of loss of control where an injury happens. So if the reference point is the sustaining of an injury, then the number of injuries or the, the injury is the lag indicator, and yes, that's negative, and everything before that is a lead indicator. But once I stop looking at that as the reference point, because lead and lag just means before and after. Mm -hmm. So if I pick a control, so say my control is um, I'm going to do incident investigations. So the lead indicator of an incident investigation might be how many investigations I do. The lag indicator might be how many I've closed to schedule. I might look at lag indicators that say, what was the hierarchy of control level associated with the actions um, that I've taken in response to the incident investigations? So they're not a negative measure. They're a positive measure that's telling us, what am I doing and how effective is it? So I think that's one thing. We have a lot of opportunities for improvement and a lot, lot of opportunities to advance where we're at in health and safety, if we can start looking for lag indicators that are positive performance measures um, because they're looking at the system and the processes. And one of the tricks with working on lag indicators is to look upstream. So we see a lot of focus on lag indicators that really focuses on the technical part of the task. But if we can start looking, so for example, I've done some studies recently looking at truck drivers. And so we can say, yes, we know that a lot of heavy vehicle road accidents are caused by speed, fatigue, drugs, you know, those sorts of traditional things. But why are they happening? If we look back up and we can see issues around scheduling of work, we can look at time constraints, we can look at financial pressures, we can look back up a level further and say, why are they happening? All of those higher level, higher order factors that are drivers of injury and illness, not truck drivers, but drivers of the incident, are opportunities that we have for intervention. They're points of intervention and they're places that we can actually start measuring and evaluating to give us more information to prevent injuries down the track. Probably the one thing that would make a big difference to health and safety management is if we were able to really start to target in on the performance measures we use. Safety culture, for example, we see a lot of focus on cultural measures, which are climate measures. When we measure safety climate, as long as we appreciate that that is actually the employee's perception of leadership, it's not about safety per se, but it's their perception of safety leadership. And then we can use that to start to drill into some of those upstream factors that we were just talking about. And I think that's where the real opportunity is, is we have to start looking at safety more holistically and take an integrated approach with business. While we have health and safety in a silo over on one side and we've got production and productivity and the business functioning on another side as a separate silo, we're not going to improve health and safety the way that we need to. And so I think we need to really stop thinking about health and safety, work health and safety, and start thinking about safe and healthy work.